Chapter 26 Visions and Passports 1. Although the memories were fond and many, they were suddenly few and hard to recall. I tried with what little strength I had left, but all I could find, randomly, was a five-by-seven nickel-colored frame on the corner of my desk. I pressed to hear something, anything. I begged God in my heart that I could hear Cassidy's little voice. The voice that was there, if it was there, stayed silent. Look to Christ, Finnegan. Not yourself, nor what you want, nor what you desire. If you seek him first, everything else, what you want, what you desire, what you need, will all be supplied to you, according to his will. I didn't recognize the voice. It sounded neither male nor female. I wasn't even sure if it was human. Yes, I agreed immediately, without inquiring from where the admonition had come. I felt an exaggerated movement of our vehicle. When I opened my eyes, I could see Leo looking at me through the weak light, breaking its way through the pieced-together contraption. He looked away, closed his eyes. Thank you, Lord, I said out loud, for everything good in my life. And there is much. I meant it in my heart for all past, present, and future. I closed my eyes again, and this time, with ease, I found a good place. There was no doubt it was by the power of God's grace. Both Nora and Cassidy sat there, swinging on the front porch. Oh, girls, I've missed you so much. Cassidy hopped up onto Nora's lap. Nora patted the swing seat a place for me to sit. I sat, and the fall breeze moved across the front yard. It's beautiful here, Nora said. We haven't seen anything yet, I replied. I know this with all my heart. I have longed for this time, sweetie. Moments like this when we're together. But to know there is more, I can hardly imagine. Looking up through the Spanish moss and into the blue, I said, Father, I'm sorry for my unbelief. I'm sorry for my selfish work. Whatever you have for me here, whatever's next, I will praise you. If it would be your will, use me. I felt Cassidy's little hand grab mine. Her head leaned into my shoulder. I love you, Daddy. A vicious side-to-side toss in the van caused everyone to grunt. Except, of course, from one. We'd slowed down with the roads that seemed to be off the beaten path. 2. I hear an airplane. A prop plane, Billy said with hope and a found energy. I hear it too, said Dominic. The engines were slowing to an idle as we continued. We rolled and bounced on the uneven road for a minute more. We stopped. We sat in silence for more than a minute afraid to breathe. Awkwardly, we sat, balanced between hope and doom. The predicament we were in made the laughter even more surprising. I'm sure to each of us the same. Otis chuckled as though he remembered an inside joke. My nerves stepped aside as his sounds caused the corners of my mouth to tighten. We found a moment of lightness, a miracle, and then guilt. Okay was the call from the familiar voice, and then a hard slap against the side of the van. The old guard opened the door, at which he was alone, but others stood back twenty or thirty feet in front of a small shack. We were at a gate. There was a chain-link fence lined up the length of what was an airstrip in the middle of nowhere. He waved at us to get up and get out. Where are we? I asked the others as we each attempted to painfully exit without stepping on one another. I think we might be flying from here, Otis said. As we piled out and stood next to the worn path, I noted that Alan, his body, was left in the box. The old guard yelled in Arabic to the young men standing next to the shack. They trotted to the young man who had been with us. They spoke for a moment and then began to close the back of the van. Wait, Otis said. We all looked at him. Prisoners, guards, and airstrip workers. Startled. No, we have to take his body. The looks from each of them were from side to side, 
waiting on another to confirm or deny this point on which Otis stood. I suppose we'd all assumed the body would find its own way. Perhaps it was that we didn't want to handle Alan's body. Maybe we just didn't want to think about it. Maybe it was fear. They spoke with the old guard. He waved, confirming his first statement and position. They began closing the doors. The old guard walked to Otis. I expected rebuke or maybe a slap to shut up. But there was only a gentle explanation. We cannot take your friend. Too much risk where we are going to explain a dead body. I will make sure to have him buried in the mountains near here. When I return. He looked down the line at all of us. He pointed to the prop plane, emphasizing that what he said was true. Otis dropped his head, just as he did when Alan first died. You're right, he said. The old guard straightened his back, clapped, and said, Okay, we need to go now. The body language of the uniformed persons indicated to us that we were to walk forward. The small-framed old guard approached me and handed me a small stack of passports. Our passports. I took them. I couldn't believe that I'd completely forgotten about our passports. A miracle they weren't stolen, destroyed, lost, or whatever, I thought. I began to open them, identify who each one had belonged to, and I dispersed them accordingly. As I looked at the picture in mine, a shadow and slight swishing noise passed just over my head. I flinched a little, looking up. On the fence post landed the black bird. Its wings fluttered as it turned to face us. To face me, it seemed. It gave a loud squawk and fluttered more harshly. It flew away beyond the few small buildings along our path. I looked up, whispering, Your will be done.